Thanks for joining us online and in the room. So this event is on the record and a recording will be available afterwards on our website. So we'll start with a brief overview of our new paper, Aligning Food Systems with Climate and Biodiversity Targets, before moving to a discussion with our panel and a Q&A with the audience. So please get your questions ready for those online, submit them using the Q&A function. For those in the room, the camera will track you if you ask a question during the Q&A. So this event marks the start of our efforts in and around COP27 and COP15. The Environment and Society programme at Chatham House has a wide range of events, activities and outputs over the coming weeks and months, including a physical presence at both COPs. So we welcome you to stay in touch with those events. So tackling the dual crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss requires extraordinary levels of action across all sectors at an unprecedented speed. So this decade, we must see a major departure from current trends or business as usual, and this is highly anticipated as the make or break decade for both climate and nature. So the paper we're focusing today's discussion around responds to this. We did a critical assessment of the policy outlook to 2030 for climate and biodiversity, focusing on land as this is where those areas most majorly intersect. So as the biggest land user, agriculture warrants particular scrutiny in this context. So we therefore kept our eye on how agriculture is dealt with in that climate and biodiversity policy outlook. We focused on the post 2020 global biodiversity framework under the UN's Convention on Biological Diversity and the Paris Agreement under the UN's Framework Convention on Climate Change. So we looked at some of the major initiatives emerging from COP26 under the Glasgow Climate Pact and also the G7 2030 Nature Compact. So this initiative in particular positions the G7 countries as leaders on these issues. So we gave more attention to the G7 countries in our assessment. We found that for both climate and biodiversity, plans lack ambition, detail and funding. Area protection is the major focus on the biodiversity front and globally plans to 2030 would see a land area almost twice the size of the US protected in addition to what's currently protected, which is around 17% of land. So protecting ecosystems that are high value in terms of biodiversity and carbon storage is absolutely crucial. But what we've seen so far is countries in the G7, for example, protecting areas that don't necessarily meet these criteria. There's also a pretty major discrepancy in terms of how much land has been protected versus how much land is reported as protected. So for example, in the UK, uh, it reports 28% of land protected, yet other analyses that focus on land in a more natural state actually get this figure to somewhere between 1% to 5%. So this would actually mean the UK has a very long way to go in actually meeting that 30% protection goal by 2030. And even then, the 30% figure itself is contested, so it's considered to be actually at the lower end of what's needed, and somewhere around 50% might be a much more appropriate as a global target. So the detail on the set of COP26 side deals around land use and forestry is still larger to emerge, but what we do know is that countries' climate change mitigation pledges up to 2030 collectively aligned with around 2.4 degrees of warming this century. How agriculture is dealt with within this policy outlook is alarming. So for both climate and biodiversity, the focus is on farm level, farm level measures to reduce the impact per unit of production, which isn't enough to even just meet climate goals. But with no, with no limits on production, there's nothing to suggest that land use for agriculture will be reduced and actually the opposite is more likely to happen. So without transforming the food system, including what is produced, how much is produced and how, protecting viable areas such as primary forests is an unrealistic goal. 
In addition to reducing land use for agriculture and its environmental impacts, we need to restore large areas of ecosystems that were lost to agriculture. In short, food systems must be aligned with climate and biodiversity goals, and currently they're far from this. We make a number of recommendations in the paper, including expanding the focus on ecosystem protection to include restoration, so both are absolutely crucial, and a focus on protecting and restoring areas that are high value in terms of biodiversity and carbon. For wealthy nations, such as those in the G7, to align the production and consumption with climate and biodiversity targets, which will also help to protect globally important areas for climate and biodiversity, such as primary forests. So this includes an immediate focus on reducing the impacts of animal agriculture, and not just through measures to reduce impacts on the farm, but also to reduce production levels. So freeing up land used for animal agriculture would actually allow wealthy nations to undertake large-scale ecosystem restoration. And of course, all countries must ensure that their domestic biodiversity and climate policies over the next decade align with global biodiversity and climate change mitigation goals and pursue food policies that are consistent with those goals. So we'll now turn to our fantastic panel for some reflections. I'm delighted to welcome James Jansen, Head of International Sustainable Land Use at the UK's Department for Food, um, for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. We have Cathy Lee from the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, and we have Ed Davey, International Engagement Director at the Food and Land Use Coalition and Co-Director of World Resources Institute UK. So I invite your reflections on the topics covered in the paper and your work in this area to help explain the perspectives that you're focusing on. And we'll have up to five minutes each and we'll go James, Cathy, Ed. Thank you. Thanks very much, Helen. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So thanks for bringing this together uh, around, you know, what is an incredibly important issue, very timely. I think your, your paper uh, successfully nailed a lot of the critical issues that we've really got to be thinking about both now and over the, the next few years. Um, th I think three points I wanted to raise, really. Um, the first is that it, it's not just important that we're having this conversation because of the biodiversity and climate crisis, but also because we're in a food security crisis at the moment as well. And we clearly need to be feeding people now. But what's important is that we don't take our eye off the ball of the longer term agriculture and, and food system sustainability issues. Um, and, and I think what the food security crisis that we're in now has shown us to some extent is the underlying fragility of our agricultural systems and the lack of resilience that they have. Um, so I was working on food security issues back in 2007-8 when we had the last major international food security crisis, food price rises, different circumstances then compared with now with some similarities too. And I think, you know, my worry is that actually unless we tackle this in the right way, then these crises will return with increasing severity and frequency in the future. So it's really important that we can address our needs now, but also address our needs for tomorrow too. So there's a second point is I'm sort of looking ahead at, you know, what are the costs of inaction? And you know, we know your paper set out the impact that agriculture and food systems are already having in terms of driving emissions, 70% of fresh water use, land use change, biodiversity loss. Um, and those impacts undermine the resilience of our agricultural systems. And I think the agriculture sector in a way is quite unique in the sense that the systems that we need to produce our food now and the way we do it are actually undermining the way in which we can produce food in the future. So um, if we're looking at the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss already, we see you know, climate change having eroded about seven years worth of productivity gains to date uh, globally. Climate change and land degradation projected to reduce global yields by an average of about 10% to 2050. Um, I think some Chatham House research last year suggested that actually by the 2040s, we could be looking at uh, you know, a 50% risk of synchronous crop failures for certain crops like maize. So more than 10% loss for, for certain crops, which could have you know, quite significant consequences for our supply chains and for food prices. And, and that matters for everybody. 
So there is a sense, you know, acting now in the right way can prevent those impacts from happening. Um, and I'll perhaps talk a little bit later about some of the work over the past year or so that the UK as the COP presidency, climate COP presidency, has done to bring food a bit more squarely into the kind of UNF triple C space. But there are clearly big economic advantages and opportunities here as well. Uh, and the, the World Bank, IFPRI, have done some work looking at the opportunities of repurposing just $70 billion of our you know, annual subsidies to agriculture <coughs> and food systems and you know, the net economic gains of 2.4 trillion by 2040 that that could deliver. So there is the potential to, to deliver significant economic gain at the same time as we're delivering for nature and for climate as well. And I think that's, that's a really important point to flag. And, and I think in that context, my third point really is around um, the idea that agriculture is part of the solution. It's very easy to look at agriculture as the problem. Uh, and I think that's quite a dangerous thing to do. And I think you know, if we have truly sustainable agricultural systems, they can be delivering not just our food needs, but also part of the climate solution and the biodiversity solution as well. We're talking about 30 by 30 protected areas in your paper. Um, we're talking about sort of forest protection and so on. You know, agriculture can be part of actually delivering on that at the same time as meeting our food and livelihood needs as well. So I just wanted to sort of stop with that reflection. I absolutely agree. And, and thanks for uh, hosting this event and the really amazing paper that um, in the past only few days, I'm actually with um, colleagues at Deloitte, at youth groups, at other civil society NGOs, and everyone loved it. So great job again mm -hmm. um, to Helen and the team. Um, and especially, I think it's such a great timing that um, ahead of the two costs, which are both really critical this year, one critical for Africa for adaptation and for loss and damage for many other reasons, and one being um, the biodiversity COP that I guess finally getting really popular, um, and also because of the global biodiversity framework, um, and also especially the importance um, of seeing how food um, plays a, a role between these two COPs and um, the biodiversity and climate space. I think it's... Um, really glad to see that it's catching the attention from whether it's public sector, whether it's private sector, whether it's um, other non-state actor groups um, that I think is just amazing. Um, and a brief background about myself and in terms of my work on food, um, I'm absolutely not the food expert in the room. I mainly focus on um, broader um, processes in the multilateral space as my background, uh, focusing on various topics like technology, finance, adaptation, um, which of course all link to food and um, other related areas like agribusiness, water, um, resilience, and um, yeah, including the work of UNFCCC and their work with FAO on food. Um, and at the same time, in a separate capacity, not relevant um, to this event, but um, I'm also the relationship manager at Deloitte, um, manage the relationship with Soil Association, um, which is my absolutely favorite um, NGO um, mm -hmm. in the UK. And um, so yeah, really glad to see this. And of course, here in the capacity as a member of the Global uh, Youth Biodiversity Network, and also um, which we've been working on NBS for the past two years now, uh, started as a small project and then <coughs> realized that um, there's so much need to gather the voices of young people across the world on this critical topic, especially given the attention it's received in both conventions of climate, biodiversity, and of course, UNEP this year. Um, and last year. Um, so yeah, really glad to see that there's the attention from the youth space and we've gathered about over a thousand responses from youth globally about what's their view on NBS, what does it mean by equitable implementation and policy re related to nature-based solutions, and of course related topics like um, bioengineering, carbon capture and storage, which Shannon House has been, um, have been researching on. So very glad to see that. Um, and I guess a few other um, points that I guess perhaps worth um, mentioning is I think the report is really helpful to help not only the readers from academia or um, the, I guess, the readers who would usually be interested in such topics, but also because of the attention this year on both COPs, on both um, topics, and especially on food production. And I think it also attracts the attention from companies or international initiatives um, that are thinking about how do we address and how do we accelerate um, work in the field of food production and related areas like agribusiness. Um, so I think it's really a valuable report for them as well. And um, 
And I, I know that one um, international initiative, which is designing the roadmap on natural capital at the moment, has benefited a lot from this report only in the past few days. Uh, so it's really helpful. Um, and also that thinking about the importance of this topic, and I guess the, the point of view that, you know, from a youth perspective, from a youth and state actor perspective, and then of course, the most critical thing for us is really about how it respects indigenous peoples and local communities, especially that they've been, um, you know, working on nature conservation for centuries and centuries and before the term nature-based solutions has been raised, it's already been implemented for centuries and, and that their rights and their traditional knowledge, indigenous and endogenous technologies and um, and ways of you know seeing topics and also their views should obviously be reflected in the international space and also be respected in any policy relevant um, to fruit production. Um, and of course, there is also a, a topic on equity that should be highlighted, um, which I'm really glad to see that the paper would be really helpful for all the stakeholder groups. Um, and also, I guess, finally want to mention that in the past about half a year, I've been um, writing a paper on a very hot topic, MDB reform, um, about how most central development banks can mobilize more private capital to support um, African nations to reach their NDCs. Um, as you all know, these are the targets towards the Paris Agreement, which is not on track at the moment. So thinking, you know, of course, for Africa, especially natural capital plays such a critical role, and, and they can use that as a leverage to unlock um, capital, which is really critical for them. So thinking the role of pr food production in Africa and how it links to, for example, global food production companies or consumer companies that largely um, have a huge issue to address and think how they link together, which I think the paper is also really helpful to help us think from that perspective as well. So um, yes, just want to say thanks again to the team for putting this together. I, sh I share your thanks. I think it's a, a remarkable paper, Helen and colleagues, and I really recommend it to everyone. I must confess, when I read it, it, it made me um, even more concerned about this set of issues and their inherent complexity than I was before. But for that reason alone, it's worth reading because it's a very good summary of this very complex and important set of challenges, which, as James says, encompass actually the whole of the global food system, all the people that produce the world's food, so there's a lot of politics and economics in this, as well as the climate and the biophysical story. And um, so kudos to Chatham House colleagues for their, their work. I just want to focus in on three brief reflections. One on sort of national change. How do, how do countries actually address this set of issues? The second is around the international concept, context and COP27. And, and the third is a sort of broader reflection about what I, what I now think of as the global need for a series of grand bargains, the plurilateral grand bargains around this set of issues. And by grand bargain, I mean, you know, audacious, bold partnerships between countries, companies, citizens, faith groups, you know, everyone involved in this shared enterprise. I think of the Marshall Plan post Second World War, perhaps not as a grand bargain, but of something of this order of magnitude that I think the world now desperately needs on this set of issues as we approach climate and biodiversity and emergency and a humanitarian emergency, as James mentioned, with the food security crisis at present. So on the country context, effectively, the, I think the invitation from the report is that every country in the world has the opportunity and, in a sense, the obligation to pursue national plans, national policies, national investments that are good for climate, good for food and nutrition for people, and good for biodiversity. And the report points out in a sense, the common but differentiated responsibilities that countries face. This transition looks very different in the UK than it does in Bangladesh or in India or in Malawi or in the US. And in fact, I will just say in passing, the, the, the passages on the UK are really quite striking because there's quite a big discrepancy between, and James, you'll forgive me for saying, between some of our national laws and policies <laughs> and current implementation. So every country faces challenges. And every country, in a sense, has the opportunity before it to pursue ambitious national plans that meet these objectives that are described in the report. But it's very, very difficult. Um, a couple of years ago in India, Prime Minister Modi pursued agricultural subsidy reform. And there were lots of aspects of what he was trying to do that were arguably uh, you know, well-structured and well-intended. There were other parts that were problematic. But those reforms, engendered a massive nationwide protest from India's farmers, or at least parts of that community. And as a result, were stymied and blocked in the national political cycle. 
in the UK, we've pursued environmental land management schemes post-Brexit, which themselves have faced challenges and are at the moment. The EU with its farm to fork policy. So in every country, there's a challenge, there's a political challenge and an economic challenge to make good policy work and to win people behind, get people's support behind the kinds of reforms that you describe, Helen, in your paper. Second point then is that the international context does give countries the chance to raise their game and raise their level of ambition. It's true in Montreal at the end of this year, we have the chance for the world's leaders to come together in Montreal and commit to really ambitious action on biodiversity. We don't get those chances very often. I was involved in the Aichi negotiations 10 or 12 years ago when I worked in the government of Colombia. These opportunities come around fairly seldom. We've got to make the most of Montreal. And then suddenly, it's true, James, that the COP27 presidency of Egypt put food and food security front and centre of COP27. And when world leaders assemble in Sharm el-Sheikh in about two weeks' time, we understand there's going to be a session on global food security in the opening of that World Leaders Summit. There will then be a session on forests and land use, which follows on from what was achieved by the UK on nature and land use at COP26. So there's a political opportunity in Sharm for the world to put the attention of heads of state on the set of issues that are in the Chatham House paper. My last point is the one about grand bargains. There are real challenges in critical areas of the world that really need global attention and partnership and support. If Lula, President Lula, wins the election in Brazil in the second round in about 10 days' time, suddenly you have a renewed political commitment from the largest country within the nine of the Amazon basin to protect those forests following a really awful period of deforestation under the Bolsonaro period of government. If that happens, we anticipate President Lula will reissue an invitation to the world to work in partnership with Brazil and the other eight countries of the Amazon to protect those forests and pursue more sustainable agriculture, reward those producers for pursuing more sustainable practices and significantly reduce deforestation. So there in one critical rainforest that's teetering on the brink of becoming a tipping point because of savannization and deforestation and the changing climate, there's one opportunity for a grand bargain. Another one to close is in the Congo Basin, which of the remaining tropical forests in the world is the last avowed carbon sink. And there at COP26, the, the governments and the leaders of the Congo Basin countries made very ambitious commitments to protect those forests. But a year on, notwithstanding lots of effort from donors and international partners, those countries have not yet seen significant global flows of finance to that region to protect those, to support those countries to protect and restore those forests. And absent that kind of support, President Shishikedi of DRC has in the last six months opened 30 licenses, oil and gas licenses, in some of the most important areas of tropical forest and peatland in the country. And in a sense, he's basically challenged the world and said, look, you know, you're pursuing oil and gas exploration in Norway, in the UK, in response to the Ukraine war, and in many other countries too, uh, Europe, across the European Union. You know, why can't we? And if you don't want us to, support us to pursue a different path in this region. So there again, I feel there's a need for a, a grand bargain or a sort of genuine global partnership to address some of the challenges set out in your report. And my very last point is that at COP26, I think 12 or possibly 15 countries came together at, at, in Glasgow uh, to form the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, <coughs> led by Denmark and Costa Rica. I think Chatham House colleagues were involved. And it was one of the most exciting things that happened at COP26 because 12, I think 12, 15 countries said, we will no, do no further oil and gas exploration after a certain date. And I wonder whether the time has now come for a similar grouping of high ambition countries to step forward in the next 18 months or so and say, we are going to, in, in, in responding to the global food security crisis, as James says, we are also going to maintain very high ambition in the long run vis-a-vis -vis our goals on people, climate, nutrition, biodiversity. And if they did that, then we might have a chance of meeting the recommendations in the US in the fall. Thanks, Anne. Brilliant. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, remarks. Really good to expand and broaden out those issues. And we've already covered COP27 and COP15 a fair bit, but we are fast approaching those two major moments for climate and biodiversity. So next month in Egypt, we have COP27, which brings leaders back together 
after the raft of measures that were introduced at COP26 around land use and deforestation under the Glasgow Climate Pact. And of course, the opportunity to increase commitments to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by the nationally determined contributions. And then in December, we have the long overdue COP15 in Montreal, uh, which brings together leaders uh, to agree the, at least the next decade of targets for biodiversity, the global biodiversity framework. So Ed's already uh, made some inroads on this, but to all of the panelists in the same order, um, up to around four minutes each to get your reflections on how can COP27 and COP15 accelerate the agenda for bringing food systems into alignment with climate and biodiversity targets this decade. And where are the immediate leverage points? What major barriers need to be addressed? And are there specific policies or mechanisms to build on? And who should really be leading in this? James. Thanks. Really good set of difficult questions. <laughs> uh, it's easy to work in silos. It feels comfortable <laughs> working in silos. And, and I think your, your question really is steering us towards the answer that we just need to be much more joined up about some of these issues. Um, part of what the UK as, as climate COP president has done over the past 12 months is to start to break down the barriers between those three Rio conventions in their 30th year. So to start thinking about how those three agendas can work more effectively and coherently together. Um, and there's clearly a need to do that. You know, the IPBES, the joint IPBES IPCC report from 2020, so looking at some of these issues can clearly show that we're tackling the nature crisis and the climate crisis in quite separate ways. We're doing some joint work too, but, but to some extent in, in quite separate ways. And, and COP26 started to break that down a bit and bring sort of nature into the climate space much more strongly. Um, but it's clearly important because what you do for climate doesn't always benefit nature and vice versa, although I think it tends to hold more true that what you do for nature is generally better for climate as well. So um, I think agriculture, the kind of agriculture, forestry, land use space is a really critical one actually for drawing those agendas together. Um, because you can address climate change and biodiversity issues in that same in that same context. So one of the things over the past 12 months that we've been uh, taking forward is the policy dialogue on uh, the su sustainable um, transition uh, in agriculture and food systems, bringing together national governments to have a conversation, a coalition of the willing, if you like, prepared to have a conversation around how we can think about public repurposing of policy and support for agriculture. Um, and I touched on this a bit earlier, but the, kind of the 800 billion of subsidies that goes into agriculture and food systems every year, um, you know, only a small proportion of that is <coughs> earmarked or is directed towards environmental ends. So, um, so this conversation has been going on around bringing these countries together to collaborate around uh, you know, what a transition in that space could look like. And over the past few weeks, we've been expanding that out uh, and bringing in the private sector into that conversation as well to start to link up those really significant private sector commitments that we saw, saw at COP26 uh, at, 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 around um, moving away from uh, supply chains with a, with a, a deforestation footprint and so on, and think about how we can start to link up these conversations in a way that will deliver for, 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 for economic and environmental and, and, and social outcomes. Um, I think the other thing to, to say just on that is the, the 10 point plan on financing nature, um, which has sort of come out over the, over the past few weeks as a, uh, a, a means for sort of bridging that global nature finance gap in a way. So bringing together um, those 10 um, key issues that would really help to address that financing gap in the nature and climate space. Um, and that repurposing of agricultural support is, is part of that conversation. And I think it's really important part of that join up between um, the, the climate and nature um, conversations. Um, I suppose the second point is why we're talking about the private sector is really broadening the understanding of why nature and climate related risk really matters. Uh, and you know, I think that is starting to become much more apparent. Um, and I think we saw in the UN high level champions report 
a, a few weeks ago, you know, the, the, the point they make about, you know, the thriving businesses and investors of tomorrow will be those who align their business models with the sustainable land use transition. And we see companies and investors now starting to identify those areas of climate and nature related risk in their portfolios and doing something about it. Um, and that's a really important move. Um, and we have you know, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures and the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures now moving in to provide an opportunity to do that in a much more consistent uh, and, and comparable way. Um, and it's really important that we can you know, help support. You know, this isn't just a, a sort of a global north thing. It's really important that we can bring the global community into that space and, and make sure that that speaks to everybody. Um, and, and I think increasingly we're looking at kind of land use and agricultural systems, not just in terms of food production and the economics of food production. Um, one of the opportunities that we have going forward is to see a much more sort of layering, if you like, of economic opportunities in the land use space. So yes, food production is absolutely paramount and important. But there are also opportunities for income from carbon credits, from ecosystem services, from the biodiversity that that land is delivering. And creating that layering, those different opportunities, helps to shift the incentives around how that land is managed. And so it's really important that we can bring kind of all these things to bear for the people who are actually managing our land and producing our food so that they've got those opportunities and they can take sensible decisions in the round, not just for food, but for climate and biodiversity too. And I think the third point is around um, the evidence base. So, so what needs to happen? We clearly know a lot already. We don't need to sit around waiting for the perfect. You know, we've got to act now. But equally, natural systems are inherently complex. And we don't yet fully understand the impacts of, you know, different sorts of interventions on biodiversity and climate outcomes. Um, I was on a visit recently to, to the Birmingham Institute of Forest Research, fantastic setup, where they are pumping recycled carbon dioxide into the, the, the forest and looking at the impact that higher carbon dioxide levels have on the ecosystem, on tree growth, on transpiration rates, on what's happening in the soil. And we don't know a lot about what's happening in the soil. Really important part of, 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 of what we're talking about today is kind of under the surface, in the soil. As carbon store and, and, and the ecosystem that's, that's down there and understanding that better can really help us sort of pinpoint what some of the critical interventions can be both from the climate side and the, and the nature side in order to deliver the best outcomes for you know the limited resources that collectively we've got so i think that's really key yeah and absolutely agree and speaking of tnfd tcfd and there's also of course companies are setting um science-based targets, um, and also that SBTI just launched this flag target on, um, what's the full name, does anyone remember? Forest land agriculture. There you go. Uh, right, you guys have done it, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, you know, great to see progress on that, and then seeing that there are many companies starting to show interest on that, and of course, besides SBTI, there's also SBTN, which is also catching much attention this year, um, and there are also various other initiatives and targets, frameworks, um, metrics, out there. So, um, you know, great to see there's so many things in this space. Um, and going back to the topic of COP, um, really great to see that, you know, um, you know, in the news also that <laughs> towards the end of last year, it says, um, COP 96 put nature at the center, right? Um, which is really impressive. And personally, I just love those um, different receptions, um, really lovely food <laughs> mm -hmm. um, during those, um, on, was it November the 6th, I think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so great to see that and also all the commitments by countries and also I think MDBs also, also wrote a joint um, statement on nature and um, there are companies making initiatives, there are um, making commitments, there are countries making joint commitments and I think absolutely agree that there needs to be a stronger global partnerships and also to address the, the questions relevant to equity and um, and I guess in terms of what's really needed multilaterally of course to see we definitely want to see stronger linkages between the climate and biodiversity conventions. And again, I think he has done a great job so far and, and hopefully our incoming Egyptian presidency will, will pick it up and, um, and, and continue to bring this forward, especially um, that COP27 is um, being seen as an Africa COP. So um, absolutely critical. And given that they were the previous CBD presidency as well. So really looking forward to see what they have planned 
for those headlight events on um, on agriculture, on nature, on food, um, and, and what will be discussed is, you know, within the Kronika joint work um, mm -hmm. agenda, but also beyond that, and, and not only within the COP mandate, but also in terms of what's happening at COP, but not just about a COP decision. Um, so really looking forward, and of course, that a global partnership needs not only government, and I think we have seen in the past year or, t or two that um, governments are important in the UN space, but it's it's still a country-driven process, but they're no longer the only ones mm. who, whose voices are being heard. And for example, from my experience in the past years working on um, getting the COP decision in Glasgow of getting um, youth and um, and women uh, representatives from the constituencies their first seats at the, at the constitutive body, which um, probably even a year ago, I, I wouldn't have imagined to getting that COP decision, but I thought, you know, let's give it a go. and. And now we have that decision. So I think we're definitely making progress and we are getting, um, making the progress that we might not have imagined in the past, just a few years ago. So I think ambition is also super critically important. Um, and also thinking about, of course, that this such global partnerships needs all the stakeholder groups. So countries, uh, private sector companies, um, MDBs and other source of finance, whether it's private capital, whether it's uh, blended finance, um, and of course, most importantly, civil society stakeholders, the ones actually driving implementation, the ones who are most vulnerable, the ones actually effect affected by both climate and biodiversity crisis, and their voices definitely should be heard. And of course, they should be considered not only in policy or implementation, but in every single element um, of the process. Um, and also just want to mention that um, within the UNFCCC space, I um, personally really would love to see agroecology being mm -hmm. um, making some successful progress, of course, um, and also, um, you know, thinking how the biodiversity COP and the climate COP can link uh, closer together. Of course, the upcoming climate COP has a biodiversity day, which is um, really great to see that there's more attention, especially as uh, non state actor groups have been advocating for stronger linkages um, for many, many years and, and finally seeing some progress, which is um, just really glad to see that. Um, and I guess the some final points is also thinking such global partnership or any joint efforts uh, initiatives. Um, and when I'm thinking about uh, corporate engagement or engagement from private sector, we also need to ensure um, the greenwashing element is being addressed and being given enough attention and especially uh, for using nature-based solutions as an example. And, if, and that um, I think there, there have been so many articles and so many voices from non-state actors, civil society, NGOs, groups um, saying, you know, calling out the, the initiatives that are going to I think we, we have seen many news, especially lately, regarding advertisements, regarding ways of communication and ways of, uh, you know, whether the, the projects that um, some companies or initiatives are doing are actually protecting the rights of local communities and indigenous peoples. So I think it's not only a multilateral um, areas problem, it's not only implementation problem, but of course also the relevance um, to national policy and um, great to see that there's the due diligence and um, all the new things being launched and of course uh, that it's great to see progress but we definitely need more ambition more ambition and more progress and stronger NDCs and stronger you know and of course hopefully a stronger global biodiversity framework than the current version with all the brackets um, so yes, <laughs> let's see mm -hmm. Okay. Ed, did you want to add anything? Just on? very quickly, two things. The first is, I think it will be an exciting COP COP twenty seven for food and focus on food and food systems. This is Food Systems Pavilion. The number of us are involved in it's two weeks of events looking at diets and nutrition and the intersection between climate and food and biodiversity. So one of the recommendations in your report, and that's partly met by the existence of the Food Systems Pavilion. Uh, although I think you call explicitly for a food, nutrition, climate day at COP, which I think is a very Good idea. Um, but the other quick observation I wanted to make is the report is very strong on animal agriculture. You're, you're fairly straightforward and, and candid and clear about the urgent global need to reduce animal consumption, meat consumption. And, and that's, that's admirable and <laughs> I think scientifically correct. Um, and, and often overlooked or often implicitly overlooked and I think you say in the report only two countries in their NDCs at present, possibly Ethiopia and Costa Rica, explicitly mention diets in their NDCs. And yet many countries can only reach their proportionate emissions reductions through addressing 
diet shifts. And I would argue that's the case in the UK slash EU as well as in the US and so on, China increasingly. So the fact that you call that out, I think is really welcome. Now the politics around meat are very complex. Um, and there are lots, lots of countries in the global south who bridle at the reference to meat in the climate sphere because many countries feel that their people aren't eating enough meat for their <coughs> nutritional needs. And I think that's a very powerful point. And the equity issue around meat is absolutely front and centre, particularly in a time of global food security crisis. But finding a good way and a constructive way and a truthful way of talking about meat and how countries have got to address the meat issue in different ways in accordance with their circumstances is, I think, a big part of the puzzle. It's often been overlooked in the climate space, but I think it's beginning to feature and that, that can only be welcome, just as it should feature in the biodiversity discussions as well. Great. Well, thank you for another round of uh, great responses. And I want to open up now to the audience. Do we have any burning questions anywhere for our panel? Anyone? I mean, so Dr. Paul Behrens here, I'm from Leiden University, I work in food systems. And just this idea of the coalition of the willing, you know, when we looked at the response to the national food strategy and touching some of these things, it's hard to call that willing. You know, when we talk about, uh, you know, leading or trying to lead or trying to talk with other countries about how they're going to be protecting areas or how they're going to be doing dietary transitions, this coalition of the willing, you, you know, you lose credibility from not doing that. And... The, you know, the national food strategy did have ways in which you could try and cope with some of the political fallout of quite a political issue, you know, livestock and meat, yet it wasn't um, adopted. So I, I guess, a, you know, a, a question would be is how, how can you at least get on that road? Because even if you make small steps, braver small steps now, they make the future leaps possible because we know that food cultures can change and they can undergo tipping points. So. You know, maybe if you could reflect a little bit on, on making those false steps now to make the big steps later on down the road possible. I think that's a very powerful point. I mean, I think the national food strategy here was remarkable. And it's so sad that only some of it was adopted and much of the most ambitious parts of it weren't adopted. Um, and I think Henry Dimbleby gave a lecture about this yesterday. Uh, and my understanding is, you know, there were a number of political reasons why it, he couldn't land the sum of it all. Um, uh, some of those political reasons might be associated with a libertarian dimension in the current government that may be about to depart from British public life. And, but, but nevertheless, you know, it's, it's the, 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 the need to build a political constituency around reform on this set of issues is, you know, is incredibly important. And what, what, what they tried to do here was quite remarkable. And in a sense, the invitation is or the suggestion is every country could try to do a national food strategy along the lines of what was tried here, but then critically implement parts of it. And I think your point's absolutely right. Small steps, whether it's on food loss and waste or healthy school meals or whatever it might be, you know, let not the perfect be the enemy of the good. Let's make progress on this agenda. Would any of the panelists like to remark on that? <laughs> Sorry. <Katie>. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you, you pointed out, uh, and, you know, the, the, the political difficulty in this space, I suppose. I mean, certainly, you know, if you look at the data, 2020, I think livestock emissions were around 60% of agricultural emissions for the UK. So, you know, I think there is clear recognition of the contribution that the livestock sector makes to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the evidence is clear that plant-based food products are generally less carbon intensive. Um, so as part of the government's approach towards net zero, um, you know, which is which is a priority for the government. You know, we are looking at a range of measures through the Agriculture Act, through the 25 Year Environment Plan, and so on, in order to help to reduce emissions from agriculture and optimise sustainable food production. Um, I mean, there are so, so there are trails, of course. So we have to be mindful that the livestock sector also delivers environmental benefits and so on, and protection of soil carbon when well managed. Those sorts of things. So, so there is a balance. There's the technological. Uh, improvements which have been taking place. So actually, the, you know, the herd size has reduced, the dairy herd size has reduced in England by just over 20%, I think, since 2000. Um, and, you know, milk uh, yields have gone up by 11%, emissions have gone down 12%. So, so, you know, you're starting to see some really important critical developments like that taking place within the sector. 
I, I think just just um, two other points very very briefly. One is around the commercial opportunities for alternative proteins, um, and uh, the government's announcement of a flagship breeding research program, the Genetic Improvement Network, which is looking at how we can unlock some of the opportunities around alternative proteins and help to support their growth and development. Um, uh, you know, things like unlocking the role of phytic acid, for example, to help digestion. Those sorts of things could be really important in, in helping to, 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 to improve those as commercial alternatives. Um, and then since the publication of the Food Strategy, um, UK Research and Innovation has similarly launched a £20 million fund looking at how we can support capacity building and research innovation in that space. Um, but linked to that, obviously, you're seeing the consumer demand as well. Um, and you know, I saw somewhere uh, that one in four of us in this country are expected to have primarily vegetarian or vegan diets in the second half of this decade. So, so there's that, that kind of individual motivation as well, which is clearly starting to come through. Yeah, I just want to add that, of course, like we previously mentioned, that it, it takes all those stakeholder groups to, to act together. And for example, um, if there's a project or any initiatives in the space, thinking, you know, who would be the one actually paying for it? Of course, they do need there needs to be policy support and there needs to be support from DEFRA, whether it's, uh, you know, in, in different ways. And also, you know, and then retailers will be thinking, we probably don't want to pay for any initiatives or, you know, any things like this because we're struggling with our budget, with our budget and making profit is, is difficult for, for them, especially with all the crisis going on. And then should farmers pay for things? So I think whenever there's anything that, that, that comes to the question like this, I think, I think you know, it really needs to make sure that everyone's on the on the same page and then thinking that we all contribute a little bit and we all make a bit of progress and so we can move forward together instead of finding um, one party that should, should be the, the, the ones taking the responsibility. Thank you. And just while we're on this topic, which Ed said we did emphasize that in the paper as one of the key sort of immediate leverage points. Um, and going back to the point of what could we really do or sort of put on the table in the in the short term um is peak livestock on the table for cop 27 and cop 15 and if not how do we reconcile the sort of no limits to growth in that sector let alone a reduction of production with legitimate climate and biodiversity goals that so for example the rest of the world could um get on board with leadership from wealthier nations, for example, if they were to at least make this kind of a declaration. Any thoughts on that? I, I don't think peak livestock's on the formal negotiation table. Um, and yet I think the notion of peak livestock or of meat consumption is, it's in the corridors of a COP more than perhaps before. And, and that can only be welcomed now, how you take what's happening in the corridors into the formal negotiations is an art form and it takes time. Um, but maybe some of the broader societal developments that you both referenced actually force that issue faster anyway, and then countries catch up. But I don't think it's formally in the negotiations, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, and I think, for example, the, the GBF or um, other source of landmark agreements, frameworks should, of course, uh, Put attention to this, but also thinking the technical negotiations that, for example, the Charmache COP, what's on the agenda of food, and then what's on the agenda of, for example, other relevant fields like the technology <coughs> mechanism that you people see is working on food, agriculture, what, what a nexus. Will that be a negotiation topic that won't be actually an agenda item? The actual agenda item is on a joint annual report. Um, <laughs> and uh, what else do we have this year? Linkages between technology and the financial mechanism, which is my favorite. Um, mm -hmm. But I think. I, I do think that there's so many ways to make progress, and especially when it comes to joint collaborations between uh, or country partnerships or collaborations with also non-state actor groups. It doesn't really have to be within a specific technical negotiations. And I think sometimes, although personally I'm a huge fan of negotiations, um, but sometimes you know we can get things done in a quicker way, and, and also we can have more unlimited, uh, flexible ways of implementation, and it, it doesn't have to sit as a uh, pro as a program of work as a work program within a climate convention or it could be a you know government-led um, country group-led and with non state actor strong non state actor engagement initiatives but i think of course it would be really great to see the egyptian presidency and um, the chinese presidency putting this at, at the center and, and making progress on this and not it doesn't have to be 
in technical negotiations, but there are so many ways the presidency can and should make progress on this. Did you want to make a point, Ed? No, obviously you have to. Well, I, I mean, I think um, your point, Cathy, about country ownership is really important, actually. So looking at this in the context of wider commitments and, you know, what works for particular countries and how they're going to implement their NDCs and in which sectors are they going to look. Um, and I think there are, you know, there's some opportunities there around sort of working in partnership, collaborating. Um, you know, one of the things I tend to come back to is, well, what, what are the natural assets, you know, the ecosystem services that we are responsible for, that we are looking after? What is that quality? And it's very hard to think about, you know, protecting that unless you understand what it is, what it, what it looks like, you know, what are the services that we're benefiting from. And once you've started to understand that, then we can think about the kind of, the, the, the kind of economic transition or the kind of sectors in which you need to be focusing that transition in order to deliver the best outcomes for that biodiversity and, 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 and in the climate space as well. So I think, I think that country ownership ownership point is, is, uh, is really important. Um, and, and of course that sits, you know, in the context of, you know, you've, pointed out the, the G7, but those broader sort of G7 leadership statements, for example, around, um, you know, committing to scale up sectoral action in the land use and agriculture sectors to keep 1.5 degrees C within reach. You know, that was in the, 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 the German G7 presidency statement this year. So, so those kind of commitments, I think, are really important. And then underneath that, having those conversations around, well, you know, what does, what does that look like in particular countries and how can we work in partnership to deliver it? Yeah, of course, that country leadership is important, political will is important, but also other various non-state actor groups and initiatives, and for example, um, you know, IGOs, NGOs, and uh, using my two other capacities as an example, global center adaptation, and also how countries can, you know, is not only in NDCs, but also in the national adaptation plans, and how, um, you know, not only at national level, and how those things turn into actual policy regulations, but also at sub-national level, at a municipality and a local governments level, how they form really a partnership with all the stakeholders in, 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 in this um, broad partnership. Great, thank you. Any more questions, please? Um, yeah, so I'm Frances from Social Market Foundation. And kind of bouncing off what was just being said, in the sense of like uh, grand bargains, how, what sort of possibility of rather than just you know regulation and policy like forcing a perspective change especially in business because you know often you have a lot like lobbyists and policy takes a long time to work through um yeah changing the perspective to one that gives business purpose more towards um environmental protection um people e uh, esg that sort of thing and obviously it's like the businesses will often be like, well, profit is our main motivator, but what about, yeah, you know, environmental protection being a motivator and profit just being like a secondary thing. And, you know, we do see this as possible with companies like Patagonia and other B corporations. Mm, yeah. I think norms are changing. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think the science-based targets movement is setting a framework. Companies are aware of what their peers are doing. You've got business leaders like Paul Pollan with his net zero work and so on, this movement for change. I'm not sure we can never move fast enough absent regulation, but there's clearly a lot that companies can do within the realm of their own action. I think there's also a role for nudge behavioral economics. Some of my colleagues at WRI work on diet shifts, you know, um, companies providing healthier vegetarian food once or twice a week in the office canteen or you know, some of the um, Panthera in the US, which is a sort of pret manger equivalent in the UK, you know, again, offering cool food. And, you know, they've, they've reduced GHG emissions by a factor of you know, tens of millions <laughs> over, over the last couple of years from, you know, what you could describe as um, um, behavioural economic approaches rather than sort of de regis economics. Yeah, I guess also briefly, and of course, I'm, I'm here in a, in a less than actor youth group capacity. Um, but also just speaking of SBTI, I think it's great to see all the attention, especially because of, you know, all the attention on, on climate and, and COP26 last year, that there were so many new commitments, um, not only to SBTI, but also to other initiatives. And for example, like um, the High Level Champions initiatives and also GFENS. But of course, recently we have seen you know, news of concerns of, uh, the commitments not turning into reality or companies um you know kind of becoming nervous again so i think what's really really important is 
for all the civil society stakeholders and for governments to keep adding pressure to the companies um, to make sure that they deliver the existing commitments. And of course, the existing commitments, we all know, um, from either companies or countries are not sufficient. So it's important to deliver the existing commitments, not to back off, but also at the same time to further raise ambition. And of course, um, you know, I think SBTI is, is a really amazing example of you know, having the new targets and getting companies and, and relevant stakeholders interested. Yeah, so yeah, really good question. I mean, I think part of what we do as government is de-risk private investment into sustainable agriculture and food systems. It's a space in which, you know, there's not necessarily a track record of, of delivery. And of course, there is the uncertainty of what agricultural systems will produce year in, year out due to the vagaries of the weather and so on. Um, so the public sector has a role there. And that's a role that we're fulfilling at the moment in terms of de-risking private investment, putting in public money as a, as a catalyst, as a sort of first loss capital, if you like. Um, I think what we're seeing is that there is plenty of private sector money there that is potentially able to flow into that space. But I think there's probably been a bit of nervousness actually around what's happening globally in terms of the food security crisis and where a government's going to come out. So I think having some very clear signals is really important in terms of reassuring the private sector about where to invest their own money. Um, I think there's a, there's a point about a level playing field, and we, we touched on that earlier, um, which comes back, I think, to the point about, about regulation and so on. And you know, one of the things that um, the UK has done through the Environment Act is put in place provisions for due diligence requirements so that we don't export our deforestation footprint onto other countries. So it's things like that the EU, the US, starting to think about those sorts of things as well. Um, but I, I think another thing that we need to bottom out is this point about sort of monitoring and reporting, kind of the MRV point. Um, in order to try and get more consistent data and comparable data and robust data in terms of what our agricultural systems are actually delivering when it comes to climate, I suppose, is a bit more established. But in terms of biodiversity and nature, I think that's still got some way to go. And so thinking about you know, how we can help support consistent and comparable metrics, I think, is, is something that we need to work on in collaboration with the private sector. And I think that's, you know, that's part of the conversation I referred to earlier around the policy dialogue. Public commitments in terms of repurposing subsidy, but actually what does that policy environment need to look like? And that's where the private sector need to be engaging and helping to shape that space so that we can work collaboratively and bring these two parties to the table together. Great, thank you. So we're almost out of time, but I just want to say that we've got the room for about 15 minutes afterwards. If anyone would like to stick around and possibly some of our speakers will be here as well. Um, so just to wrap up, could you give us um, half a minute each on your final thoughts that you want to leave us with today? I can kickstart. Um, just to summarize, I think it's um, you know it's, it's quite easy to, to to tell that this is what I want to see is for both cops to, to for countries and for non state actor groups, whether it's private sector, whether it's um, youth <coughs> groups, whether it's um, women led groups, whether it's indigenous peoples, local communities, to use these two cops as the opportunity to showcase ambition and of course the global biodiversity framework is absolutely critical and important. And we need to make sure the important things that are currently in brackets are out of brackets um, and be adopted. Um, and for the climate COP, of course, hopefully the Egyptian presidency will use this as a great opportunity to raise ambition and, and attract more investment and support to, to the Africa continent. Um, and also about the global partnership, it's um, hopefully there will be more initiatives and more ways for all the stakeholder groups to join efforts and to make sure there's all the most vulnerable and most affected communities and voices are being included um, and being respected in those in those partnerships. I think around agriculture really is part of the solution. I mean, I think that 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 is really important in terms of that understanding of agriculture as a means to help deliver the global biodiversity framework. It's not a barrier to it. It can really help deliver that in terms of helping to deliver our climate objectives um, if, if if we get that right. Um, the importance of acting on that now, of course, but actually as individuals, the most important thing we can do, which you've helped facilitate today is just talking about it and really getting across the urgency of action. You know, emissions have got to start coming down by the middle of this uh, middle of this decade. Um, 
if, if we're going to have any chance of keeping within 1.5 degrees. So actually talking about it and bringing home the urgency of action is really key. I agree with you. And I think farmers at the table, at the heart of this issue, this set of dialogues is absolutely critical. The Food and Land Use Coalition has as one of its nine members, the World Farmers Organization, which represents over 100 unions of farmers from around the world, from the UK to Ethiopia and the US to, um, to Zimbabwe. We need farmers at the table. We need farmers at the table in the climate negotiations, in the CBD. We want to avoid a situation where farmers are being billed as the quote unquote enemy, where in fact they actually could be and should be at the heart of the kind of transition we're describing. Brilliant, thank you. And unfortunately, we're at the end of our formal chat today, but I just want to thank everybody for joining us and especially to our fantastic panel of speakers for all of your insights today. Really useful to expand, I think, that context out. And thanks for everybody for joining us online. Um, as I said, we do have the room for a good 15 or so minutes, so please feel free if you would like to hang around. Um, and yeah, look look for look out for a lot more from us in the lead up to COP27 and COP15. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.